Everyone showed a lot of self-control. Since the government had accused us of instigating turmoil, we were eager to show the people that we weren't a lawless mob, nor were we trying to overthrow the Communist Party or socialism. So he's saying that the students are all peaceful and self-constrained and not a lawless mob. We'll see how that plays out. Another note is that the banner on this frame is actually not what the subtitle says. The banner actually says that firmly follow the correct leadership of the Communist Party. I think at this point, many students are on the street for very different reasons. It's kind of like a parade. I don't think everybody is protesting with the same idea, with the same belief, demanding the same things. At one point, the clash with the police was so intense that people could have been trampled to death. I was almost crushed in the crowd. But it was obvious that the police were not ordered to beat people up. They only tried to form a human blockade. The students met little further resistance. They continued their march toward Tiananmen Square. Well, I thought everybody was peaceful and self-constrained, and they are not a lawless mob. So what happened there? The fact that the police was ordered to not beat people up, and the fact that the students break the human barricade of the police, not for the first time in this protest so far, and they still went through with no one injured, all seem to suggest that the Chinese government is far from this people-hating, oppressive tyranny that the West media claims to be. Especially with the ongoing nationwide protests in the United States about police brutality. And we see how the American police treat protesters. If you try to break a human barricade from the American police, it's going to be a very different picture. That's a fact. At one government bureau, a group from the countryside was trying to get their grievances heard. Grassroots democracy hadn't reached their village, so they were doing what they'd always done, kneeling before the offices of the central government to beg for official intervention in their local problems. Oh god, this is so hard to watch. I mean, why are they showing this clip of these villagers begging here, which is totally unrelated to the student protests? And they are also very different democratic from the students. And also, democracy hasn't reached their village. That's the problem. As a matter of fact, the leader of the villages are always determined by the villagers themselves. And this dating back to centuries, even back in the imperial times. If you watch carefully, you can see that none of them are crying real tears. They're just making sound. And what are the odds that they are just there begging when there are students around and there are millions of foreign journalists around. I have many reasons to doubt if this is staged or not. On the note that it's not even relevant to the student protest, it's just there in this film to serve the purpose to show you that how on every class of Chinese people back then, people are miserable. Which is just not true because with Deng's reform at this point, people's lives are already better than what they had before. So every school already has student unions to represent the students, regardless of protests or what. And as they said before, that they bypass all the school student unions and then they form their own union, which could be a legit idea, but then they fail to democratically elect their own leaders. But somehow they feel like this undemocratic organization somehow is more legitimate in representing students' voices. And this whole movement is supposed to be them fighting for democracy. But in fact, many of the leading voices of the May 4th era spoke not for revolution, but for democratic reform. This narrative is somewhat true, but it's misleading in this exact wording. For a very long time, democracy has been 
coined as the Western electoral democracy, and this is the only real democracy. That is not true at all. Not only is electoral democracy only a form of democracy, but also the context of the May 4th movement in 1919 was triggered by the result of the First World War, the Paris Treaty, which which the Western countries decided to give the German-occupied Chinese territory over to Japan instead of returning to China. And this sparked a lot of anger among Chinese students. So the May 4th movement essentially is a patriotic movement that's calling for an independent national identity. It's an anti-imperialism movement. You can say that's also calling for democratic reform, but I want to put out the context there so you don't misunderstand it as people back then were calling for establishing a Western-style democracy in China, because it was not. On May 8th, several leaders of the Independent Student Union of my university came to see me. They complained about the students who had returned to class and said they wanted to blockade the classrooms. I said, I thought you were demanding democracy. A basic principle of democracy is the right of individual choice. If you deprive others of their choice, how is that different from the way the Communist Party has always deprived you of your choice? As is so often the case, democratic procedures were getting in the way of political action. Unable to achieve a consensus within the independent student unions, the people in favor of a hunger strike bypassed the new organization and made personal appeals to the students. Once again, more undemocratic things from the students. At this point, it's hard to believe that these students really believe in democracy, the very thing that they say they're fighting for. I said, we are staging a hunger strike in order to reveal the true face of the government and the true face of the people. This is Chai Ling. At this point, I want you to pay extra, extra attention on her. How she's going to see the true face of the government and the true face of the people is unknown, but we will see the true face of her. So the talks were wrecked by the students themselves. I felt that May 14th was a big setback for the student movement. After this, the students missed many more opportunities by repeating the same mistakes. So they wanted this undemocratically elected student union to represent the students, and eventually the government gave in and hold a dialogue with them, but they subtouch it. It sounds like a very chaotic movement with no particular faith. The message we got from them was this. You people have gone too far. You have to do this gradually. Listen to your mommy and daddy. Listen to your government. Well, all I have to say is, what have you done that gives you the right to criticize us? The interactions between the intellectuals and the students are very interesting, because the intellectuals are there to help them with their movement, to help them achieve their long-term goal, if they have one in the first place. But the reactions from the students are extremely naive and ungrateful. They would applaud to anything that praised them. Do you really think these people would know how to run a country with 1.4 billion people? We really weren't willing. We decided not to move. Because, well, I'll quote the words of a foreign reporter. He said, you are already on a hunger strike. What more can they ask of you? To be fair, no one asks you for anything. You are the one doing the asking as well as the threatening. If the government can simply stand by and watch while the students' lives slowly waste away like this, we will have to take even more drastic measures. We will set ourselves on fire. If the government is callous enough to see these children starve to death, then I will be the first to die. I said this over the loudspeakers. I said, I was willing to be the commander-in-chief. I don't remember my exact words. I said, the only criterion for a person to join the hunger strike leadership was a willingness to be the first to die, so that other students could live on. This starts to get really dark. 
and it's not from the government; it's from her. When she's saying that she's suggesting students setting themselves on fire, it just reveals how evil she is as a person. At this point, the government didn't do anything to attack them, didn't do anything to persecute them, didn't do anything at all to them. The second point is that she clearly wants to be the leader. She clearly wants to be in the power, but she doesn't want a democratic election. What about democracy that you claim you're fighting for? Gorbachev met with party leaders like Zhao Ziyang, who looked to the Soviet Union as an example of political reform, and with others like Premier Li Peng, who were wary of everything Gorbachev represented. There are clearly two opinions regarding Gorbachev's、uh, reforms. But history tells us which one is right. His reform is one of the leading factors resulting the collapse of Soviet Union. The life quality of the citizens of the Soviet members fall drastically after the collapse of Soviet Union. Looking back at that history, I can tell you that most Chinese people do not want that. There's never been a generation like ours, one that mocked the state, mocked the government, mocked the leaders. Clearly, he knows nothing about Chinese history, and I'm going to ask you this question: If you think you have such freedom, who gave you that freedom? The more he talks like that, the more he shows how ignorant he is. The very leader that he's opposing, Deng Xiaoping, he actually went to France to study when he was just 16 years old, and that year was 1920. So I don't know how Wu Keixi think that he sees more of the world than anyone else ever before. And he's never been out of the country at this point. And there's never been a generation that has seen that the outside world is so beautiful. But let's look at what's so beautiful in the world that he saw and no one ever saw before. Nike shoes. Nike shoes. <laughs> For example, during the hunger strike, some students were actually eating. They felt that the hunger strike was only a means to an end. Our aim is to put pressure on the government. So why should we make real sacrifices? Um, what? Once you turn your sacrifice into a hoax, you lose your moral integrity. Exactly. Since the breakdown of the May 14 talks, it was no longer clear who really represented the students. And whose fault was that? The students suddenly announced the end of their week-long hunger strike and began a mass sitting. So the hunger strike that was irrational and insincere to start with just ended out of nowhere. We're moving towards the very end of the protest, and still it's not clear what they want. What makes me really sad is that I am the commander in chief, and I can't let go of this power because I must resist compromise, resist these traitors. The leaders of the independent student unions of Beijing and of the provinces are all after my power. She was not democratically elected. She recommended herself, and she is refusing to let go of the power. Sounds like a dictator to me. For a brand new People's Democratic Republic, we will fight to the end. At this point, all dialogues or conversations are officially out of the picture. She is publicly calling for a coup. I don't like calling the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949 liberation. Did Mao really liberate the Chinese people? Gradually, people realized we're not really liberated. I can understand what he mean, but I think liberation means different things in different contexts. The founding of the PRC liberated the Chinese people from wars and from Western imperialism. Any liberation on a personal level is meaningless if you can't live in a sovereignty country with an independent national identity. So, I think liberation comes in different stages and different levels. You can't say the founding of PRC is not a liberation because it's not at the stage that you want now. There was a heightened sense of community, of giving, of shared sacrifice. It was said that even the thieves had gone on strike for the common good. Okay, this is just the pure propaganda. I mean, who told her that? Did the thief told her that? 
She's like the fight for democracy is so glorious. Even thieves had an epiphany. Like, oh my God, how can we steal anymore? Because a few students saying they are fighting for this glorious democracy, even though they cannot democratically elect their own leaders. Faced with a territory and a population to govern, the student leaders on the square found themselves recreating in miniature all the real-life problems of having and holding power. External threats of government repression meant enforcing internal security. Disagreements with the leadership were labeled betrayal, sabotage, by the familiar small handful of plotters. Struggles between the groups vying for power in the square grew increasingly ugly. Why am I not surprised by this? Often we had to suppress three or four coups a day. At the time I even joked. Now I finally understand why Li Peng wanted to suppress the students. <laughs> After the press conference, Li Lu raised objections to our proposal. Then Chai Ling changed her mind and decided to oppose it too. The people who made the decision to leave the square on May 30th had a very negative effect on the movement. I attended the meeting, but I didn't realize at the time how harmful the decision would be. So regardless of how much these people saying they are fighting for democracy, they really have no clue how democracy works. Regardless of the fact that they were not democratically elected, but the decision to retreat from the square was an agreement between these student leaders. And it was announced to the students at the square. And she shows no respect for it and she just retracted as she wants. Remember she just said she's opposing someone is using the movement to make themselves famous? Look at the way she talks and how much she enjoyed the power that she never got from democracy. So she publicly said it again, overthrow the government. She is really good at using provocative words to manipulate people. It always feels like she is intentionally pushing things into a tragedy.